Michael <laughs> is a good friend and neighbor of me, whose uh, who's, um, medical expertise Mark and I have taken advantage of <laughs> more than once as our eyes are aging and we run into question marks and complications. Um, he did his um, undergraduate at UC San Diego, earned a Bachelor of Biology, did his medical training at UC, um, and no, at University of Texas uh, Health Science Center at San Antonio, went on to do his ophthalmology residency at UCSF. That wasn't enough. <laughs> so then he went further and did what I'm calling a fellowship in retinology. Is that uh, right. just <laughs> it's okay. Mm -hmm. um, at the uh, at the Jules Stein Eye Institute oh, wow. at UCLA. So you know, famous, talented guy. Uh, he's got too many awards and publications to count. <laughs> um, so uh, you know, ophthalmologists tend to either focus on the front or the back of the eye. Ophthalmologists that if you go to routinely that take care of things like your cataract surgery, that's the front of the eye. That's not Michael. Michael's a retinal surgeon. Michael's a real retinal expert. So without further ado, let me introduce one of my favorite people, Dr. Michael Leahy. <laughs> Thank Thanks, Jim. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm grateful to be able to share uh, you know, any of the knowledge I have with you. And and so this is a very interactive, I guess every lecturer is different, but, uh, uh, you know, anytime that you have a burning question or you want clarification or I'm rambling too much, uh, feel free to jump in. Um, apologize for my voice, but I'm COVID negative times three over the last two weeks, but grandkids are worth it, but uh, they will affect your uh, health occasionally. Um, yeah, the, we started with uh, the title, The Aging Eye, and I thought, do you guys really want to be reminded how old we all are? No. So um, Journey to the Center of the Eye is actually the uh, first album by a, 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 an English group called Nectar, who was my favorite band in high school. Uh, so ironically, that's where I ended up living a lot of my time is right in the middle of the eye which is kind of weird um, that I also, I, you know, before you give any lecture, you got to thank some people, you know, Jenna for inviting me and Mark uh, being such cordial neighbors. And I wouldn't have ended up being so tight with them. If it wasn't for Nancy, who happens to be the sorority sister of my mother, my late mother. Uh, so there's a lot of connections here. And I know Vicki and some, some of the others, I think I've met on and off through Jenna. So I thank you for having me. Um, and, uh, let's get started. Uh, we're going to cover these, you know, to learn, you usually need repetition. Um, but these are the big four for, you know, we're not doing pediatric stuff, even though you guys aren't, you're, you're not old if you can get better and you guys are, you know, you're doing pretty well. So, uh, these are the big four for people our age cataract, which is a cloudiness of the lens and macular degeneration, which is a genetic disease, it usually passed on from uh, families and it can be increased by smoking or uh, high blood pressure. Glaucoma, also a genetic disease. Uh, and the open angle, which we'll get to, uh, is, is often genetic. And diabetic retinopathy, which is also genetic, uh, the type two at least. And uh, my specialty uh, deals with a lot of people losing vision. And before we had some of the treatments we have now, when I came out of Toolstein at 1993, people just lost vision. And part of my job was hanging out with them while they were losing vision. So now it's because of technology and more that we have things to do while people are losing vision, but they're still losing vision. And we'll talk a little bit about the definition of blindness and uh, some of the treatments that we have for it or don't have for it. Uh, initially, I had about 200 slides for 
these three hours because the more I started thinking, I want to tell him this, I want to tell him that, uh, I added more and more stuff. I'd be sitting there watching some kind of Netflix thing and go, oh, but no, you know, let me add this, let me add that. Um, but I think, and so what I wanted to do is, because you guys are all Ollie people, you're not, you know, sub-average. So, so I wanted to treat you guys like medical students. So I even asked Jenna, can I give them a whole bunch of slides before the course? You know, you can prepare, but we always start with the anatomy. Like your first year of medical school, there's not any disease. You start with anatomy and embryology. So let's go over uh, just the anatomy of the eye. This is a cutaway cross section of the eye. And I'm a retinal specialist. So I like to think it's all about focusing the light on my organ, the, the retina or on my organelle, uh, the retina, which is uh, this uh this area right here, this yellow area um, uh, in between the choroid and the sclera. And it's pretty, pretty big. It actually spans that whole area. But when you're looking at me, you're using this small indentation. We'll talk about that indentation called the macula. So when people say they can't see, the majority of the people are talking about they can't focus light well on the macula, or if they do focus it well on the macula, the macula is not functioning well, so it can't send that image to the brain. So if you start in the front, you have the cornea, which is an avascular structure. It's the one area, one of the few areas in the eye you can transplant. We'll talk about an eye transplant because when you deal with people going blind, a lot of people say, well, why can't you just transplant the eye? I'll explain that to you. You can transplant the cornea and it does better than a lot of transplants with a lot less suppression of the immune system because it's not supposed to have any blood vessels in it. And one of the reasons for that, and the lens also has no blood vessels. Why? Because it's all about keeping that image clear all the way to the back of the macula. So you've got the cornea right there. The iris, much like a camera, will open and close depending on the amount of light. Uh, and then you have the lens, which is focusing the light on the macula. And there's the vitreous body in there, which uh, really what they call us are not retinologists, is vitreoretinal specialists. And the guy that taught me at UCLA liked to say I'm a vitreoretinal surgeon, so I, I usually say that. Um, so the vitreous body, uh, one of the common surgeries that a, a retinal specialist will do is removal of the vitreous. That's called a vitrectomy. So people say, well, how, how am I going to see after that? What do you put back in? We just put it back in saline and the eye replaces that with the aqueous humor that's uh, produced by the ciliary body right alongside that area right there. Um, so you can see better than 2020 if you have your gel removed. So why is the gel in there? We'll talk a little bit about that. Um, so here's the lens. And at our ages, a lot of us have had cataract surgery. And there's zonules that hold the lens. And there's a capsular bag that holds the lens material. So when you have a cataract surgery, they're removing the material inside the lens, leaving the capsule, and putting the new lens into the capsular bag. That's what a cataract surgery is. When I first started, uh, we were doing that, but we weren't using small incision or foldable lenses. So we had like 10 and a half millimeter uh, openings, which is almost like a third of the circumference of the uh, limbus, which is, you know, right where you go in near the cornea. Uh, and now it's about 2.8 millimeters. Um, before I started, they were removing everything. They would put an enzyme in the, the uh, front of the eye that would loosen those zonules, and they would pull the whole thing out. And that's why people had these thick spectacles, because the power that is in that lens was not being replaced inside the eye. So that's a little bit of the anatomy. Any Oh, then we, we got to talk about the optic nerve. It's kind of important. That's the transmission cable of the, all the retinal cells. Their axons are forming the optic nerve. And that goes back to the lateral geniculate nucleus. That goes back to the occipital lobe. So it's not as complicated as it sounds. You only have to know a few things. So why can't we transplant the eye? This is, I like to talk about this because vision is still very precious because it's not a commodity. It's not something you can easily replace. And the reason is there's about, about a million or a million and a half 
fibers of the retina going back all the way to the lateral geniculate body. So if you cut that, let's say you're doing some AT&T work uh, and you've cut a cable, how are you gonna make those connections to the donor and the host line up? Maybe they'll figure that out in a few years, but we're not close. The other reason is, is traveling in the optic nerve in the very middle of it is the central retinal artery and the central retinal vein. If you cut the artery and the retina does not receive oxygen, it's gonna die in 90 minutes. It's gone, just like the brain. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about the relationship of the retina and the brain, because uh, they are related. The retina pops out of the brain as you're developing an embryology. So that's why uh, the retina especially is, is very precious. It can't be transplanted or replaced. And this is, uh, you know, as a retinal surgeon, we kind of like to think we're neurosurgeons, right? So this is to kind of show you that there's a lot of similarity. You can see all the different layers of the cerebral cortex. And then over here is the retinal layers and uh, the rods and cones at the bottom. And the rods and cones are just specialized cells that further develop after the optic vesicle splits away from the developing brain. When you sure. um, are referencing that, if you could make a point, because sure. it's really hard to see that little point. Sure. Might be hard to do that. I, I do have, I think, a laser pointer, yeah. but then they won't see that on yeah. Zoom. We can get you, uh, <laughs> yeah, well, I think the key thing isn't for you to know the inner nuclear or the outer. Like at the very bottom are the, the retinal pigment the epithelial cells and the rods and cones, and lights coming in at the top. Um, except uh, there's, there's no light sensitivity that we know for the brain. And that's because of that specialization right there. Um, so that, that tells you that, and like, if you drown or someone's drowning and they pull them out, we've, we've heard of this where their brain is, is dead, but their body's still alive. Why is that? Well, your muscles can live a long time without oxygen, but the brain has six minutes. So if you cut off all the oxygen to the brain, we'll talk about sleep apnea at night, which is significant where you're not getting oxygen to the brain. It's a significant issue. You're not going to do well with that. So this is, uh, many of you have probably seen a retinal specialist. And one of the things we should do uh, during the question answer period af afterwards, and especially in the next ones, because if you do have specific questions about your eyes, the more stuff like this that you can get, if you can get a scan of your eye, I can teach off of that scan. Otherwise, we're gossiping about what you think you might have. You know what I mean? Uh, so this is an OCT scan that takes about five minutes to do with undilated eyes, and it revolutionized our, our, um, our specialty. And again, you can see all these different layers uh, of the red, almost like you can see them in histology slide. So when I started, we didn't have this. And in the middle of my practice, this was developed. And it basically light is shined into the eye and it bounces off the retina. And that reflection is measured by all the technology into this. So this, this is a revolutionary thing. What's OCT today? Optical coherence tomography. That's why we call it OCT. We're the kings and queens of abbreviations. Like even the other MDs go, I can't read your note. There's like three letters for everything. So anytime you have that question, I've tried to avoid that. And then just a quick thing to make things fun, occasionally I'll throw something like this. We don't have the best vision of all the animals, actually, the birds of prey do. They have very, very deep uh, foveal pits and they have two foveal pits, especially the raptors. Um, so when you see an OCT and you see that little indentation, that's good. And I'll tell people, I'll, I'll show them their scan while I'm, examining them and show them here's your scan and i'll say this valley looks good and they look at me like but then i'll point to the picture on the wall that has a little valley and they go oh it is good because it's up there but that's that valley is very important and part <laughs> what's that yes yes we will get to that i would have told you so many more things that we had three or four hours um so 
as ophthalmologists, we like to think everything's about the eye. And so we, we often say that the eye is like the ganglion on the end of the brain, or the brain is like the ganglion at the end of the eye. Mm -hmm. So this is just a quick slide showing that those cables that have 1.5 million are going right below the pituitary there um, and then crossing and then going to the lateral geniculate and then back to the occipital lobe so that you can see there's processing and all those layers of the retina. Yes, Mark. Um, it seems that they, well, you have kind of the same focal length of your optics there, that there should be a, a plane or, or a smooth surface where you have the best focal. I wonder why that fits. For for the retina, yeah, but the thing is that um, it should be either out of focus on the rest of it or out of focus in the. Um, it is yeah. well. That's one of the reasons you. There's a lot of reasons. Like if you don't have macular vision, you don't see well. Like you can't read. You can see a sign on the side of your vision, but you can't read it very well. Uh, uh, but we'll get why the macula in particular can read fine print and stuff like that if that's where you're getting at. Um, and this shows, this is something that real quickly that if you have lesions, this is kind of the fun part of ophthalmology. Okay, no, somebody's not seen well or has a complaint. You have to, you're like a detective. Okay, where in the system is the problem? And if you know the system, you can kind of figure it out. So, right, this shows that because creation is not that simple, Half of the fibers stay on one side. Those are ipsilateral fibers. And the other half cross. So there's this particular, if you have a pituitary tumor, which would be this lesion right here, you're going to have bitemporal hemianopia. That's this right here. Um, so this is just to show you that if we do a visual field on you, and if you guys have sat on a visual field, press the buttons, and you haven't had enough coffee, and you're falling asleep, it's boring, but this is what we're trying to figure out. A lot of times it's glaucoma and we're trying to see how much you've lost. But but if you were worried about a brain tumor or something in your orbit or something elsewhere, this kind of mapping is really important. So that's kind of not to show you to understand all that, but understand this is what an ophthalmologist is doing when they're doing visual field tests on you sometimes. If you have a lesion in the occipital lobe, it's known to have very, very similar patterns on each side that are typical of occipital lobes. In other words, you could have a little comma-shaped thing on one side, comma-shaped thing on the other side, that tells you it's occipital lobe. So again, this is the visual pathway. And again, some of the fibers stay on one side, they go to the lateral geniculate, then they go to the occipital lobe. And the visual field has a little central binocular field, and then the visual field you can see from each side of the retina, this retina is seen this side, it's pointed there, that one's seen that side. And the pituitary gland is actually not there, it's kind of under here. We'll talk a little bit maybe if we have time about the superior, super, super chiasmatic nucleus of the hypothalamus. I don't know if any of you guys take melatonin, but uh, the pineal gland secretes melatonin at night and kind of gets you into a diurnal rhythm. Um, and that's related to the retina sending a signal through your sympathetic nerves to the suprachiasmatic nucleus. And then that regulates the hypothalamus and a lot of your hormones and everything. So that's they, a lot of people are treating depression with light. That may have something to do with it. We, we did show you some anatomy, getting back to the anatomy, because some of you here may have glaucoma. Um, when you hear about glaucoma, one of the things I'm going to try and uh, teach you guys is that when you hear uh, like, oh, he has glaucoma, oh, I have the same thing. You might not. You probably don't. Uh, like there's open angle glaucoma, and that means that this trabecular meshwork, sorry about the blurriness, hard to find a good one on this. That's the drainage side of the eye. So fluid's created here by the ciliary body, and it goes around the iris, and it drains out from here. So when an ophthalmologist sees you have high pressure and wants to determine what type of glaucoma you have, he's going to put that lens on your eye like that. And it's a mirror because when you look straight at the eye due to optics that I used to understand much better, uh, with total internal reflection, you, won't, you can't examine it without a mirror and an angle. So that is, allows you to look into the angle by these angled mirrors 
to determine is the angle open. That's the most common type of glaucoma, open angle glaucoma. We'll talk a little bit more about that later, but this is the anatomy that when you hear people talking about the angle, that's the angle right there. Uh, and that's how we examine it. So uh, open angle glaucoma is a genetic thing. Closed angle glaucoma, you may have had pharmacists or friends or, or doctors say, you know, I wanna give you an antihistamine or I wanna give you some cold medicine, but I'm worried that you have glaucoma. If you have open angle glaucoma, you don't have to worry about it. Closed angle glaucoma, people that are hyperopic or have narrow angles, those are the ones that have to worry about those medicines. And that's a smaller subset. Um, and then there's also uh, one of the themes that's going to weave through this is sleep apnea. Low tension glaucoma is what we used to call this in the old days, where we would measure people and we'd look at their eyes and we'd go, it looks like you have glaucoma. But every time we measured their pressures, it was normal. What was happening is at night, they were heaving and they were struggling to breathe. Their, their venous pressure was going up, their blood pressure was going up, and their eye pressure was up, but no one's around to measure it. They come back in later and they find their pressure is normal. What's going on? So now a definite big part of the subset of low tension glaucoma we know is sleep apnea. And they'll have an open angle. So um, that's a little bit about glaucoma. I'm not a big, that's why I went into red glaucoma. is Because uh, uh, you could do surgery on glaucoma people, you're not returning any vision. You're protecting what they have left, which is a hard thing to get people to do. And that's back to this thing I was saying, you, I'll tell people like, did you, they'll have a bad history in the chart or they don't know what, and I'll say, did you have a gas bubble put in when you had your rectal attachment? And they go, yeah. And the person sitting with them said, oh, I did too. And they're thinking that they have the same thing. We use gas bubbles for all different kinds of things. So one of my things that I see patients making the mistake of is having a friend that has something similar and thinking, that those things apply to them. And it's, that's a common mistake for patients and doctors sometimes. So this is, um, this is the vitreous body uh, picture from Jerry Seabag. He was one of the first guys that really studied the vitreous because every, everyone looks at it and sees it. And the cataract surgeons are trying to avoid it when they do cataract surgery. Like when a cataract surgeon, we call it when he breaks the capsule and vitreous comes into the operating room visualization, you see it come into the eye in the front, that's not good. That's a sign that um, uh, the capsule's broken and the, the, the cataract surgery is now complicated. But for a retinal surgeon, we go into the vitreous all the time. Um, and the vitreous body fills this whole area back here. When you're young, it's solid and it's attached from the back of the lens all the way to the retina. And People don't have much floaters. As we get older, it liquefies. Like if you put jello out on a counter, it'll slowly liquefy. We call that senuresis. And when it does, eventually you'll it'll pull away from the back of the eye. And we'll go over that. That's called a posterior vitreous detachment. It's a normal part of aging. And people present at that point with floaters and flashes often. That's a sign that you need to go in and get dilated because. If you call somebody up and say, I've got new flashes and floaters, they should get you an appointment in two to seven days, mm -hmm. you know, but with healthcare now, who knows, you know, and, and I was just thinking about giving this talk. I was thinking, man, healthcare has really changed since I've become a doctor, but some of the ladies here delivered children like 50, 70 years ago. So you guys really know how much healthcare has changed more than I did. So. Um, so a little bit more about the anatomy of the retina. Uh, you've got the optic nerve uh, over here. I don't know if you can see that there. And over here, that's the optic nerve. So that's the cable. And those are all the retinal ganglion cells, which are axon. Their ganglion axons are forming that optic nerve and going back to the brain. So that's the actually the natural blind spot because there's no retina there. That's where the cable leaves. So it's normal when you have a visual field to see a blind spot on each eye due to that. And the very, very center of the macula is called the fovea. And we'll go over that anatomy, why what Mark was talking about, the shape of the fovea is such uh, and why it, uh, that area is very important. 
Um, so the macula, within the macula is the fovea, the fovea centralis. And the word macula comes from the Latin word spot. And I should tell you that the word vitreous actually is from the Latin word glass. Uh, it means glass in Latin. And the guy that I joined in, Kaiser, was a, he was a Catholic and he taught me some Latin that I didn't know when I joined. Um, Mike, can I? Sure. Clarify. So the whole back of the eye is the retina, right? But there's just this, that small region is specialized. That's what this slide is. Like, like I, that's not even the whole retina. That's as much as we can get on a wide field and that's a collage. Um, so that little tiny area right there, maybe even smaller than my finger, is what you're using when I'm when you're looking at these things. When you're looking at me right now, you have the if you if you're aware, you can see the cars going back and forth and the mirror on the side and even the ceiling. That's that all peripheral retina, which is not specialized like the macula. So the the macula is a tiny, tiny area, but it's 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 like downtown, you know. It, so it has receptors in there, but they're somehow organized or something different. Yes, you know. we'll get over that. There, and, and that's, you know, it's the back of the eye. So the whole camera is to focus on that film. And that's one of the things I'll tell people when they have lost vision in retina. They'll go, okay, you know, I'll say, well, we've given you shots, but you have scarring and they're 2100 and they're, and they're not happy. And they're thinking, okay, so so I need glasses now. Well, not really. Um, because like a camera, an old camera, like we, we remember the old cameras, you have film. So if you have a spot on the film, no matter what lens you put on that camera, you're going to have a spot on the photo, right? Same thing with the retina. The retina is like the film in the camera. And um, if especially the macula in our society, reading, driving, watching TV, that's all macular vision. And they, they do have devices like, you've got to be some Star Trek fans in here, where they're trying to like Geordi, they call it the Geordi, and that, that was like 10 years ago, and it's no longer around. But it, its idea was to take an image, a video image, and put it on the other parts of the retina that aren't specialized in a larger video image, since the macula is destroyed, and we can't fix some of the destroyed maculas. But it's not that easy to do. All right, what is the phone Fovea is the very center of the macula. So the, the remember, spot is macula. You can see the spot. People looked in with their direct ophthalmoscopes many, many years ago, and they said there's a brown spot next to the optic nerve. So that was called the macula. And the fovea is the very center of the macula. So if I'm looking at an OCT and I'm deciding on a patient, should we give them a shot? If they have fluid on the outside of their macula and they're not symptomatic and it's been stable, most people don't want shots in their eye. I'll say, well, we can watch that. But if they have fluid right on their fovea and it's active, those ones, you you know, you, you encourage them to be treated. So, yeah, there, we, there's the macula, there's the fovea, and it's a little, you, you don't hear about foveal degeneration, you hear about macular degeneration. So the fovea is like focusing the, um, the light. It's not focusing. It's, 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 it's it's collecting, it's like the film. So everything in the front of the eye, the cornea, the lens, is all the focused light on that fovea. And then that, that, those rods and cones, all those layers of the retina are processing it, even before it sends it to the brain to process it. There's, there's like internuclear cells, there's all those different layers. And they're, they're both vertically and horizontally processing things with different colored cones which is a, like, I don't even have the expertise to give a good lecture on that, but it's, it's not simple. And that, and it's not all known. And that then is sent to the brain and that is further processed by all those layers in the brain, horizontal cells and bipolar cells, um, vertically and horizontally, yes. Do you have a shot for macular degeneration? Where, where do you put whatever you're putting? In? I'll show you that, but it goes into the vitreous cavity. So I'll have a picture of that. Yeah, and you know, when you, you, somebody sits down in front of me for the first time and they never had a shot in the eye, they're looking at me like, no, you're not. <laughs> so the first shot has to be good and it has to, it, it can't be painful or, you know, because they need repeated shots. If anybody here has had shots, and I know some have, um, 
you've got to have them sometimes every six weeks, every two months. And so if it, I mean, there's brave people out there, but if it really hurts a lot, they're not going to come back. So when I give a shot and somebody says, did you do it? And they, and I go, yeah. And they go, oh man, that was good. And, and I go, don't tell anybody that, that is, you know, you can, if they need a treatment, but you want to go home to your family and go, I got a shot in the eye today, you know? Yes. Um, two questions actually. Where does the uh, image get reversed upside down? Because optically, it's going to be in the eye upside down. Yes, that's correct. That's good. Is that in the eye? Is it in the, in the operation of the eye or is it somewhere? It's focused on the back upside down. It's a virtual, you yeah. know, it's an yeah. inverted image. Yeah. I actually had slides for that, but I had to get rid of something and I never liked optics that much. But um, yeah, and actually when we have, have you ever seen an ophthalmologist put that thing in their head and they're holding a lens and you're tilted mm -hmm. back and they're looking at you? I've done that a large part of my life. The image that I'm looking at is upside down and backwards. So if I'm lasering you and I need a spot to move that way, I've got to tell you to move the opposite way. But so the processing in the brain, the brain, the brain does yeah, reverse. yeah, it'll fix it. It'll fix it. And so, that, you know, when I showed these slides to Mark, who I thank for saying those are way too many slides, but it had this stuff in it because I, you know, these questions come up. Uh, I, he said, this is a very important slide. So I wanted to put this in here again, because remember, the eyes like a camera. This is focusing. This is focusing. This is the film. So all it's doing is receiving it and it's starting to process it and it's going to send it back through the brain through this cable right here, which is the optic nerve. And the optic nerve from the pressure of glaucoma can be damaged. We'll go over that. Um, but it's pre the pressure in the eye is pushing on all those axons in the eye. And uh, you can do experiments where you put a little glass probe on the axon. Anything that slows the flow of axons, which is much slower than blood flow, will damage the, cause it's basically blood flow is health and axonal flow is neural health. And both of those things remove waste and give nutrition. So, you know, when green waste stops delivering or stops picking up, it's a problem. And that's a lot of, a lot of dishealth or, or disease is due to that kind of problem. So a little bit more talk about the phobia. So we talked that the cornea doesn't have any blood vessels. The lens doesn't have any blood vessels. Why is it? Well, blood vessels have stuff moving in them. Red blood cells are moving. So if you're trying to focus something and you have things moving through them, that's not going to be good for focusing. So the, the lens is clear. The cornea is clear. And these layers all around the macula have blood flow in them. But they're all pushed away for the very center of the body. But that's how important that area is. Everything's pushed aside so that when the image comes in, it's almost directly hitting the pods and cones without any of the other neurons even in the way. Yes. What, at, at what level of that uh, are your uh, receptors? Uh, receptors are on the very bottom. Cones oh, are, oh, and, oh, they're, oh. and mostly cones. Rods are in the periphery for dark and cones are most of the color vision. So very few rods in there. And not only are they there, but they're much more differentiated. And like the, the cells underneath these are important cells too. They're like the mother cells called RPE cells. They're not pictured in this here, but a lot of macular degeneration when you damage the RPE cells, which are the mother cells. So every night you go to sleep, the cones shed all the, everybody thinks you need to eat carrots and vitamin A rods and cones, right? So there's, there's tons of, uh, of vitamin A loaded in these outer segments of the rods and cones. There's stacks of them. And at night, the cones, which aren't needed as much, they'll shed all those. And they're gobbled up by the mother cells, the janitor cells, the hardworking mother cells, right? They do all that work. The, those cells are also pumping out fluid all the time to keep everything dry. It's a neural network. You don't want fluid in a neural network. So um, the cones in the center of the phobia are specialized. They're even more, they're larger and they're better than the cones that are spread out through the rest of it. Like, like if I look this way, I can see you have a green shirt mark. Those are cones mostly that I can see that. Um, but the cones in the center of the phobia are specialized and the RPE cells, the mother cells underneath them, those are specialized too. 
So it's an incredible organ, you know. Yes. Color blindness is in the body from color blindness is usually due. Uh, it's oftentimes X linked, and it's it's due to a problem with either the red or the green cones. Usually, yeah. It's been a while for that, so I don't want to say too much. Is this? Is this magnet directly at the back of your eye and the optic nerve is offset or? Yeah, oh, so your, your, your uh, blind spot or the optic nerve is nasal to the macula. Yeah, and, uh, and you'll see that on a visual field. We'll show you some visual fields and I'll show you the, the phys they call it the physiologic blind spot because there's no retina there. If you have an accurate visual field, there's no detection of light there. So it's normal to have a blind spot there. So back to OCT again. Now this does show the RP cells. Now underneath the RP cells is a rich, rich, rich area of blood vessels called the choroid. So the, the RP cells, those mother cells are working hard. They've got to get rid of some of their products. So there's a tremendously high blood flow there. And again, sleep apnea, if, if you are transmitting, I often do this to patients where I, I show them a valsalva maneuver, my whole face turns red. And I go, that's what's happening to the choroid. It's being engorged, right? So this is the, the choroid or blood vessels that grow through these layers. And the best metaphor I heard from this was a teacher at UCSF, Howie Schatz, who's now like a world famous photographer and one of my heroes. But he said, it's like grass growing through the cracks in the sidewalk. So as we get older, these layers, which normally don't let anything through, there's Brooks membrane here. Uh, is another basement membrane that prevents blood vessels from traveling or going through. But as we get older, these areas crack with genetic disease like uh, macular degeneration, they will crack. And then with low oxygen, we think a lot of macular degeneration, the wet form is due to low oxygen. These blood vessels start to grow trying to provide oxygen to the tissues that don't have it. They grow through and they start to leak and bleed. Um, so. We, we will show you pictures of wet macular degeneration, but I like to show normal, which is what they do in medical school. You learn normal, normal, normal. And one of the teachers I had at UCSF, Bill Hoyt, who is the godfather of all of neuro-ophthalmology, he was the first neuro-ophthalmologist. He said, enjoy your normals. Like you really look at them so that you can tell the difference between normal and abnormal. So to get that scan, you just have to sit up there and a technician will sit there. I I'm usually not involved in it. If you ask me to do an OCT on you, I probably could futz and fumble and probably not be able to do it. Um, but the technicians we have are great and they can do it in less than five minutes, both eyes. In the old days, if you had a retinal problem that we couldn't diagnose without a scanner, we would do angiograms. And I did have some slides for those, but it's rare that we do an angiogram anymore. So this was a revolution right here. Uh, and again, that's the normal. And there I was telling you about fluorescein dye. There was a risk of, of anaphylaxis because you put a dye into the vein. And then we took pictures that we didn't even get them to fully you know, turned into positives. We would read negatives after people waited two hours in the clinic. And then we decided if we would laser their eye, which for macular degeneration usually didn't work and people lost vision. But between OCTs and these injection, things have changed a lot. So again, what when you hear somebody say, I have macular degeneration, if you have macular degeneration, you may not, you probably don't have the same macular degeneration that your friend has, because there's, there's multiple forms of dry, but the most common form of dry is, looks like this on OCT. So you have drusen, that uh, are around Brooks membrane and the RPE. And what are those? They're like collections of material over a long period of time. Like imagine if you cut bread every day and a little crumb fell on the floor and nobody cleaned it up for a long period of time. Pretty soon, due to genetics, you'll get a buildup of these bumps. And drusen comes from a Czechoslovakian word meaning crystal in rock. And that's the the most common form of macular degeneration is the dry form. About 80% of people have dry macular degeneration. They don't need shots. We encourage them to take vitamins. 
the vitamins may decrease the visual loss and the conversion to wet. Um, but this, even without wet, can be a significant cause of visual loss. There's, there's things called geographic atrophy, and we call it geographic atrophy because it looks like the state of Florida took over the, uh, the macula, and it's, it's basically loss of cells. Um, and uh, again, the, these are the chromosomes, chromosome 1 and 10, where before I, in 1993, we didn't know about this. In the middle of my career, people figured out that actually there's genes associated with this, and they're in the complement fixation pathway, which is an inflammatory pathway in the body for all kinds of inflammation. Yes, Jen? No, uh, because you can have 2020 vision with drusen. But if you have like those were pretty bumpy, the ones I showed you, you can have much smaller ones. That's why I'm saying there's dry and there's dry and there's dry. There's all different kinds, but you can you can, usually you'll you'll know after five or ten years that there's been some change in your vision. But a lot of people aren't aware when they get diagnosed. Yes. Uh, in there, uh, one of the reasons why. The that's a good question sometimes that's a really good question because we usually give people a graph you guys may have been given these graphs Amsler grids i'm not a big fan why because if i stare at long enough i start to see stuff it's like an optical illusion so you don't need a graph like you could cover one eye and you can look at a door jam and the horizontal and vertical lines and you can check right now with each eye and you can make sure that they're straight i'm good for another day that's how long it takes. Um, but if you use that graph and stare at it, especially if it's not a, a cardboard graph, but it's paper and it's a little wavy itself. Uh, and then once you know you have some waviness, it's that's your baseline. If you don't have wet and you have dry with some waviness, I tell people, okay, keep checking. And it's not, I mean, people don't like to do this. You know, we, we say these things again and again and again, but this is being involved in your own care, right? So if you look at it, and you know what you have, then you'll know if it changed and then you'll know to call and get in. So anytime, this is true, even if it's not talking about macular degeneration, anytime you have a sudden change in your eyes that you've never had before, you should call and let somebody look at it because it usually is significant or it could be significant. Like the posterior of interest attachment, which we'll get to where the gel pulls away from the retina, 95% of the time is nothing, but one out of maybe a hundred, you have a retinal detachment. Two out of a hundred, you have a retinal tear that caused the retinal detachment. Retinal tears don't always cause a retinal detachment. So remember that I showed you normals a lot. You're probably like, why don't you keep showing that slide so that you could look at that and go, okay, I see the difference. So what are we seeing there? Well, first of all, there's the color on the side. And the color shows that you have some blood <clears throat> and it's Usually you can tell if you're a retinal specialist where the blood is by kind of a lot of things usually, uh, but that blood is subretinal, uh, which is typical of the location of these new blood vessels. So remember, these blood vessels are growing out of the choroid through the retinal pigment of the feeling or around the retinal pigment of the feeling or underneath it, and they're leaking in the bottom part of the retina. So scarring occurs down here. This is called a uh, pigment at the field detachment. That's short for... Uh, so I'll stop scratching the screen. Sorry about that. Uh, that's short for retinal pigment epithelial, and we call those pigment epithelial detachments. Um, so again, there's another form kind of in between wet and dry. When people say they have macular degeneration, say, well, you know, on social media, oh, I have macular degeneration too. I think I have what you have. You probably don't. Again, you know, um, so this is, this is cystic change or fluid that is occurring because the mother cells are no longer pumping fluid out. And so the retina is getting a demodus above it. And we would give a patient like that because it's right. This one is below the macula, but there's a significant thing going on there. And it doesn't look like it's just been a day or two or three. And how much vision they'll get back is very hard to say. And when people ask me like, okay, how much am I going to see after we're done with all this? I said, don't you have an aunt or a, a loved one where you know, she was dying of cancer and the doctor came to the bedside and they said, well, how long is Aunt Josie going to live? And the doctor says, not more than a week. And seven years later, she's alive. So you learn not to make predictions with biology because biology is very unpredictable. But in general, you can kind of know 
Uh, like for instance, if you have a large subretinal hemorrhage, which is oftentimes associated genetic wet macular degeneration added to sleep apnea. So at night, people are, you know, their whole phase of turning red. So their choroids and gorge and they're popping blood vessels underneath their retina. And then you get all this blood underneath there. And uh, that's one of the causes of large subretinal hemorrhage or people are on blood thinners and they have wet macular degeneration. They'll get larger hemorrhages. The problem with the blood is that it damages the rods and cones. So when I was at uh, Jules Stein, we, one of my teachers, Halel Lewis, he said, you know, these have such poor prognosis, even with injections, they still have poor prognosis, that why don't we go in, make a hole in the retina, put in TPA, which breaks down blood, and suck out the blood before it damages all the retina. And so there were pilot studies and publications for that, but it turned out that people were getting more morbidity from the surgery and and not any great visual results. So that kind of went away. And at that same time, people had developed very tiny forceps and we would go in and pull out surgically the blood vessels. The problem is those blood vessels came from the core and through the retinal pigment epithelium. When we went in and pulled those things out, some other stuff came with it that you need, you know? <laughs> or if we got it out clean and we were, you know, everybody took pictures and showed them at these, all these, you know, meetings and look at, you know, hey, uh, the problem was, is that they came back. So that was, yeah, it's not an easy game to win. And so the retinal specialists are a lot different than the cataract guys. The cataract guys are done. Yeah. yeah. Another, another victory. Um, so this is classic subretinal fluid. So that's fluid underneath the retina. That's the phobia. I would recommend treating something like this because it's a fair amount of fluid. So I'll commonly show almost every time the picture to the patient unless they're so blind they can't see it. And if they can't see, I'll show it to the person that's with them if they have somebody with. Because when you can see a picture it, and they know it's them and you can explain what you're doing and why you're doing it, it makes them very comfortable. Um, here's some more. Yes. So treat it with IVF, you just, uh, Pardon? Yes, we would treat it with intravitreal injection. Yeah, and not and if one doesn't do it. You usually will do a cluster of three or four, and then we try and extend it. Now the studies that first did it, we'll get to that too. It's called the CAT study, where when well, this is a long story, so we better wait till we get to those slides. But most of the studies were done. They just put people every four weeks. They got injections. Of course, the results were great, but trying to get somebody to come back every four weeks for even just a year is hard. So the results were good, but as five years went on, a lot of the gain in the visual acuity was lost because it's hard to keep coming in and mm -hmm. people go on vacation or the doctor's away on vacation. And yes? Uh, at some point, when you talk about the relationship between the macular degeneration and blood thinners, Yes, we could talk about that now. In general, a lot like in the old days when somebody was on blood thinner and let's say we were going to do a surgery in the retina, we would call their internist. They would either put them on heparin or they would, uh, you know, put them in the hospital and gradually lower it. We would do the surgery and then they and they put them on heparin to go back. They'd stop the Coumadin, uh, and then they, nowadays. Like when I left, because I was most of the surgeries we did, we found we had no problem doing the surgery without stopping the Coumadin. And I feel like uh, you're definitely at more risk for everything when you're on a blood thinner, aspirin included. Uh, you know how th these, this is the thing about medicine, like women know this, okay, like 50 years ago, menopause, everyone agreed we got to give these people estrogen men and women were like to give it give them estrogen then people got uterine cancer and breast cancer they're like all right no estrogen no more we're not going to do it. <laughs> and 20 years later we'll give a little bit of estrogen we'll give some progesterone like a normal cycle so there's these definite fads in medicine even in medicine even in science and one of the fads is everybody needs baby aspirin right that was really strong like 20 years ago, just like everybody needs Lipitor now. Um, and then if you go 20 years later, they're kind of like, oh yeah, you really don't, maybe don't need to take it now. 
or it's not a bad idea, or you don't need to take it every day. But if there's a strong indication, like we'll get calls from the emergency room saying, you know, I see that, uh, you know, you have a patient with diabetic retinopathy or macular degeneration that has, has had bleeding, um, but they're having a stroke or a heart attack. We want to get TPA, which breaks down a clot. Okay. So we want to get TPA right now. What do you think? Well, even for an ophthalmologist, it's hard to say, you know, the brain and the heart beat the eye. So if, if it's for your, for you or your family's general health that you don't have a stroke, then it's worth taking that risk. Yes. We're going to get to retinal vein occlusion, but they, they use the same shots. Like the joke, if you go to a retinal meeting now, no matter what disease, there's sometimes argument on what disease, but when it comes to, okay, what are you going to do? Everybody just starts laughing. We're going to inject that medicine. So it, to follow up the analogy of that this is like a piece of film. So when you, the, the problem with vision, is it because your film is wrinkled? It's a topology thing? Or yes. Is it because the actual receptors? All of the above. Right. And, and the previous question on, on metamorphopsia, we call it, or wavy vision, like the kind of waviness you get when you have bumps, and this the light coming through, and it's it's not only not hitting it at the right angles where you know the eye was developed, but it's lifted, and the mother cells and the cones under there are tilted. There's fluid in there, so yeah, waviness is like a it's a big sign that there might be something going on. Your your brain probably corrects some of this. Some of it it does, and you know the personalities are different. If somebody's very ah, the waviness, the waviness, the waviness. There, it's 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 going to be hard for the brain to to do it. Where if you got a person, I was like, yeah, there's some waviness there. Those people end up ignoring it. Um, yeah, so that it, it's amazing. There's a disease called asteroid hylosis, which is you know those Christmas things that you shake that have all the little snow. Okay, yes. we'll all see patients that look like you've just shaken one of those snow mm -hmm. globes, and I'll ask them, do you have do you see floaters? And they'll go, no. To get pictures of their eye, we have to do an angiogram because the way the filters work with the angiogram, we can get through those with the angiogram. Um, and yet they don't see them. Why is that? It's because they've come along slowly. They don't all of a sudden appear. And as they come slowly, the brain adjusts. Like that's the thing about cataracts. Cataracts are growing in all of us if they haven't been removed, but you are adapting because we're meant to adapt, right? So it's not until it reaches a threshold where you go, damn it, I just can't read anymore, that you go, okay, it's time to take it out. Or if you go to a guy that's in private practice, he'll go, turn on the lights, are you having trouble reading? Well, it's time to take it out. <laughs> yes. Do you have a question? No. Okay. Well, I just, is there, was there a genetic element to this? What, that oh, yeah. Macular degeneration, chromosome 1 and 10, but smoking and blood pressure make it worse, for sure. Smokers are definitely... Uh, they not only will have stuff in the macula, but when I look at their peripheral retina, they have all these, uh, like, uh, we could, uh, their pigmentary lines that you see, reticular pigmentary lines, uh, especially in the smokers. I've seen a lot of those in the vets. One more thing about sleep apnea. This just says that all the stuff that happens in sleep apnea, low oxygen, uh, increased sympathetic activity, increased blood pressure. Uh, a lot of people with sleep apnea will have uh, you know, atrial fibrillation. And, you know, as important as I think sleep apnea is, I'm always sad when I'm starting to suspect it because it means somebody's going to have to try and get used to putting something on their face all night. So a lot of them get thrown against the side of the wall the first three weeks. Nobody wants to do it. But when you're going down low enough, like 72%, if you have mild, I think just avoid alcohol at night, sleep on your side, sleep with a partner that goes like this. Like, you sound like you're obstructing again. But um, yeah, like it, it's it's tough. But if, you, if you're going down to 70% at night, we talked about how long the brain can go without oxygen and the retina. And so it, it, those are not anaerobic organs. They, they want oxygen. They're aerobic. They want oxygen all the time. Right. So these are the kind of, these are massive subretinal hemorrhages. Uh, and whenever I see one of these, I'll start taking 
Do you fall asleep easy when you get in a warm car? Do you wake up tired? Uh, do you snore loudly? But snoring's not bad. If I'm snoring, I'm going, that's okay. There's no obstruction. It's when you're going, that's not good. Occasionally snoring's okay, and then you get an elbow. But uh, <laughs> occasional obstruction's okay. So that you can see that, that that's the kind of like things that we were doing at UCLA because you can see that's not going to end up well. So you don't have much to lose. So the guy I was with Lel Lewis, he's he was making openings in there and then injecting TPA, and we'd sit around for forty five minutes because it takes TPA away a while to break down the uh, the initial early clot, and TPA won't work if it's an old clot. So it's not a magic. Uh, but the, those surgeries didn't do well. And oftentimes, because there's so much pressure, that blood will somehow leak through and pop into the gel. And then they've gone from like really bad vision to almost hardly any vision just seeing light because now there's blood all through the vitreous. So that's never a, a time. It's really sad. So it's a good time to talk about legal blindness. So legal blindness the diagnosis, well, first of all, I've had people that see 2020 with contact lenses going, I'm blind to a retinal specialist for like, you need to see a different doctor. You, you got to go to the optometrist or somebody else because, you know, this, the kind of stuff we're dealing with was the previous slides. Um, but a legal blindness you, is, is a, defined as 2200 or worse in both eyes. So, um, or, let's say you have retinitis pigmentosa or you had um, something that took away your side vision like glaucoma is one where all you're seeing, like I can see really clearly, but I can't see on the side. So that's less than 20 degrees in both eyes. That's legally blind too. So a lot of times I'll have somebody who's legally blind and say, hey, can you give me a handicap sticker? And I'm filling that out. And they go, will you fill out my DMV form? I go, you got to pick one or the other. You know, you can't have both. Uh, you, you you should be driving if you're legally blind. But I tend to fill out those things if you're not legally blind and let the DMV decide because my job is to try and keep people doing what they're doing, not to try and limit what they might want to do. I'll leave that up to the, the DMV. But I don't know if you remember about 20 years ago, there was a guy that was kind of our age or a little older and he had a car and he drove through the Santa Monica uh, promenade and plowed down a lot of people. That's when the DMV really started like, okay, we're gonna, you know, the government workers start going, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna really watch what's going on. So it's a lot harder now. Now here's uh, something that's good to know if you have a loved one or you yourself are legally blind, especially from macular problems, people will come in and say, I see a yellow pony or I see people in the room and they'll say, they'll be scared to tell their loved ones because they don't wanna be put somewhere, you know, <laughs> or thought of like, you're crazy. But it's a known thing. Charles Bonnet was a uh, neurologist, and the mind wants visual images. Uh, you know, most people have gone to TV and away from radio, right? In general, so we tend to crave visual images. So when you go blind, sometime in your life after you already have a big library of images, your mind will put images into the areas of your cerebral cortex to to allow you to see again. But they can be anything from like a light or a star or people or animals or, or anything. So it's good to know about that so that if that starts happening to somebody you know or yourself, you realize you're not crazy. But there are crazy people that are blind too. <laughs> so let's talk about intravitreal injections a little bit. Um, how are we doing on time for this? Well, are you figuring you want to take a break? No, I, I, what's it, whatever you guys normally do. Yeah. How, how far along do you think you are through your car? Uh, I don't know, because I, I, I hacked up a lot of it, and I could always add more if we get through stuff early. Just, so We're at the one hour point, so it yeah. might be a good well, yeah. for a break if you want to take Sure, break. sure, sure. Yeah. All right. Okay. All right. Straight or 10 minutes? Everybody's <laughs> I have built a house. Well, people have two eyes. <laughs> I was not reading a medical documentary, but I saw a documentary and it struck me through this is a documentary saying that your mind is. Exactly. 
what you see in your in your uh, small section, excuse me, all that you see, the rest is made up. There is like the they're, they're all like like um you know those visual exactly. tricks where like you know how they leave parts of uh, uh, words out and stuff uh -huh. and your brain will fill those in so your brain's capable of doing a lot well, of that well it didn't mention that reality this is like something yeah. called reality and this is what part of it's saying you really don't know reality because my yeah. puts a lot of something in there oh okay. because all you see is that this thing that is it's super sensitive, Definitely. accurate, the whole thing, and the rest of it that you think you saw, yeah, you just put in by your mouth. Like in other words, like imagine the all different perceptions yeah. of just the talk I gave. There's going to be everything under the sun. Yeah, yeah I agree. Well, and and to each of those person, it's their truth. What was yeah, their reality? Exactly. This is also about the subject of reality. Yeah, uh, yeah. Into law and everything. Oh yeah. I saw something. Yeah, and if you're a sports fan and you see like Angel Hernandez call right. balls and strikes, you're gonna go, "This is not my ring." Like, <laughs> that's, that's the other thing. Yeah. Yeah, like I'll watch like Draymond Green kicking somebody in the balls, and then you know people say, "Oh, that is that was not a unnatural movement." I go, "That is what you see." That you know. I'm not saying that you're seeing that. Yeah, I totally agree. Uh, use that like scientific stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Dealing with a scientific, I'm. Uh, very oh, uh, we can't. Oh, like uh, 40 years ago. Oh, that was in the 40s. Okay. And uh, also, they were like the same uh, channel. Oh, so, they probably they, put belts on the ground. No, that's. Did they put you in bed? No. No, the uh, thing they reattach it with, as you said, the gas. They put in gas in there first. And then I don't think they put fuel. They put in gas to push it back. And then they had a hard time attaching it, so they tried. Then they tried pulling, and finally stuck. Yeah, now they come a long way. I'll go over. Since that's my specialty, I've got oh, okay. different ways to reattach a retina coming up. Yeah, but one thing that I have now, everything was used. I've been good for a year, pretty much, even though I have glasses. This this was the beginning when they started the holding our the uh, lens, and apparently they wasn't exact, so it's not really close. Yeah, but, but right now we're at the this doctor here in Japan. He has maybe you know that. I don't know a lot of this. Yeah, he has. Well, anyhow, and they said they were they're concerned about the smooth bubble. Way back a long time ago, you know, this one eye was fine, the other one didn't. So when I covered my eye, I had to wiggle my eyes to so get the right focus point to get the thing. And you have some visual loss. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But see, that's you learning how to use what you got to Yeah, right, right. It's also exacerbated by the fact that blended lenses have to do it so that it's in the right spot, too. Yeah, well, sometimes I'll tell people, if you're using a computer, don't use a blended lens bifocal because you got to find out one small area to sit and get, get lenses made just for a computer or just for a distance. That'll help out a little bit. So far, I don't need I just I've got a wrinkled retina. What oh we're gonna talk about that too. Okay, yeah, because it doesn't bother me. They said it won't do anything that. Yeah, we can talk about that, but it's pretty common, like on a lot of OCTs, you'll see just a little bit of a wrinkle, but when it really pinches the retina, because it's not an opacity that's a problem, it's that when it grows, it contracts, and then you get like again, if you use those grid, you'll see wavy vision. Are you sure? Those are two. Those are two. Uh, good. Welcome. Well, 
They got worse. I've seen a lot of people connecting me because they get to another level special. Diagnosed with a beta clue 2020. Went down to count fingers vision. And that's why I mostly will tell them like for me, I would want an injection at 2020. Especially central. Yeah. yeah. And we can talk about that too. Like there's there's two different kinds of veins, there's, and there's all kinds of spectrum in between. But there's systemic. Remember when we talked about if you stop a blood flow to the retina for long enough, it's dead. So that's the ischemic conclusion. And then the non-ischemic could go on for a long time, and you can treat it, and it will recover. Sometimes in that. We try them, yeah, yeah. We use them for both. We're different reasons for the first same reason. Yeah. Now, the goal of the injections is to be the least amount to keep you seeing as well as you can. You kind of have to experiment with that because it's hard to predict uh, how long the injection will last. Yeah. Yeah. Anything changing now? You have to do it. So I've had OCG last couple of years, and I have, I don't know what the condition is called, but it looks like on the retina, one of my eyes, it's not on, in the gray part, but on the top of it, where it's a little... Probably an epiretinal membrane or a macular puck, or do they say you have a wrinkle in your eye or a little scar tissue? I don't know if it's like a, a little bit of a hair or something. Uh, but anyway, my question is, did you say at the beginning that if we provided you with a skin, you could Yes, if you that? get it, because that, that's the nice way to teach is okay. right now we're not doing much for each other because yeah. you're not exactly sure because, yeah. yeah, he might have explained it well, but a lot of times we don't explain it. Well. Yeah, it's only like every If you can get a photo, you could send it to me or Dan, and then and we can put it up there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Get, it, get it, because it, we should be able to get those things, and that would be cool. Because otherwise, I'm just throwing up random Google slides right. or some of my own slides. Okay, okay. Yeah, I'd be glad to. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. I think it's talk about lazy eye or optical migraine. Uh, you could. Lazy eye, uh, you know, there's a lot of different types. I, that's something I removed. Like, like, if I can get through a lot of this stuff, uh, then I can add that to some of the stuff we haven't talked about. But since I was, I took out lazy eye. But, there's a period where your brain sends the thing. If you're like, if you have a general cataract and you're not seeing well at all, if you don't read those by three months, they won't matter much if you do. Whereas the lazy eye, where you're one working in the other, like the age, the third neighbor, and they don't talk about business, and the that can be fixed by straightening out and getting some plastic. Some people have a general plastic. Sometimes the lid is coming down. All this been weak, but I I could see it. I mean, I yeah. Sometimes they lay down and wake up. Some have to sit again. Oh, oh yeah. Do you know? Because it really is hard to see. Oh, my battery is getting low too. Thanks. You said I could expand. Maybe for the next time. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to that. So do we just do questions or do you talk to 
questions? Should I just do questions or keep? Okay, so uh, one of the things I'll, I'll remind you guys, if you guys can get, if you have questions about your eye and you can get a scan or a doctor's note, I can decipher the doctor's note and the scan, hopefully, uh, with, you know, electronic medical records, it's no longer a matter of doctor's handwriting, so um, hopefully we could do that. And uh, I have a lot of other stuff in an expanded version of my talks that we could get to, depending on how much we get through. But I, I kind of wanted to focus on retina, because if I get too far away from retina and start talking about strabismus or lazy eye or uh, really detailed glaucoma stuff, I'm not really going to be an expert and I may, I may falter there. So uh, some of this is going to be heavily on retina, but I'll, I'll give anything a stab. I usually don't give a no comment. So, uh, all right. So we've talked about injections already. And what are we injecting? Okay. When I was a resident at UCSF, we used to sit in ground rounds and they had an animal model of taking rabbits and putting uh, some pellet near their cornea. Remember, the cornea is not supposed to have blood vessels, right? But by putting an irritated pellet next to the cornea, these blood vessels grew into the, the cornea and you could take pictures of it. So then people started harvesting what, what is the chemical that's making those blood vessels grow. So when we're in our mother's womb, how do we form an arm? What tells it to keep, you know, what brings those new blood vessels out? Because you remember, we talk about blood vessels as being transport and waste management and nutrition, right? So at the ends of all these things, those blood vessels on the cornea or well we're developing in the womb is a chemical called vascular endothelial growth factor, also known as VEGF. Again, we, we abbreviate everything. Um, so when we saw that as a resident, they go, well, we're gonna somehow figure out, because that's what diabetes partly does, is it makes new blood vessels grow out of the retina and they bleed into the eye. Uh, macular degeneration, there were new blood vessels growing underneath the retina, they were bleeding in the eye. So early on, we all knew that, well, the people doing science all knew that if they could figure out a way to block this chemical, that would be a good treatment for a bunch of diseases. And the very first uh, approval of an anti-VEGF medicine was by Genentech. And if you guys own Genentech stock, you'll remember when this happened because it just went vertical. And they were right about that. It, it ended up being a huge, huge drug called Avastin. So Avastin wasn't the first VEGF, but it was the first VEGF that worked well. I won't talk much about Macogen. Uh, that, that was a very, it was anti-VEGF, but it was very weak. What, when Avastin came out, it was for colon cancer. Why would it be for colon cancer? Well, colon cancer can bother you by obstructing, by growing in your intestine and giving you a bowel obstruction, which is a big bother or it can also bother you by sending out tumors all over your body. So how do those tumors get nutrition? Because they're not worried about removing waste. They're just like destructive. So they get the nutrition by forming new blood vessels. So in those tumors, especially the metastases, you have VEGF. So it was approved for colon cancer. So at the time, Genentech told the ophthalmologists who were like going, oh, no, you got a Bastin. They were going, you can't use it in the eye, it's too big. And we're gonna make a special molecule from Avastin. So Avastin is an antibody that, an antibody looks like a Y. Well, this, that's a simplification, but it looks like a Y. And up on my hands are those grab the molecule, okay? So an antibody works by, whether it's a virus or a chemical, it kind of scours the surface and it makes a shape that fits lock and key almost, okay? So when you make an antibody to something, it's gonna pull it out of the system. So that was, the idea would be you'd shrink your metastases because you would rob metastases of blood flow. So they, they then went on and got FDA approval for Lucentis, which was if you take a Vastin and cut off this part and just have this part, that's what Lucentis is. And it's a smaller molecule. Well, smaller molecules aren't necessarily better because they'll diffuse out of the eye much quicker. 
So a smaller a Lucentis molecule works well, and it was FDA approved because it works great. Every four weeks, people got shots, and we'll talk about the CAT study. But it doesn't last as long because it gets out of the eye quicker. So uh, we also inject other stuff too. Uh, if, if you've ever had an injection and it looked like you have a whole bunch of floaters, that was uh, Kenalog or triessence. And it usually, after two or three days of floaters, it'll settle down. And those are steroids. And the steroids work great for a lot of the swelling. They, lurk, they work better for just pure swelling in some conditions than the anti-VEGF. But if you have a cataract, the steroids will cause it, uh, or sorry, if you have your own lens, the steroids will cause a cataract. Or if you have a family history or you have glaucoma, it'll shoot your pressure way up. So uh, right now, even though I used a lot of steroids when I practice. I'll have old patients that have my number somehow, and they'll say, Dr. X is not, you know, uh, it's not working. I'm not seeing one. I go, well, what are they using? They're either using the anti-VEGF, but they're not, they don't have macular degeneration. They have just edema and the steroids work great for edema. I said, well, why don't you tell them to use the, the uh, Kenlog or the Ozerdex? Ozerdex is an implant that's coated and it looks like a baton and we inject it in the eye and you can see this thing floating around in the eye a little bit. That'll last for three full months, which is great compared to like four or six weeks for the anti-VEGF. But the reason, you know, both patients and doctors have come to think that good medicine is convenient medicine. And believe it or not, a lot of medical decisions that doctors make are due to convenience. If they use a steroid, they have to, worry about you suing them if their pressure goes up. They have to bring you back for another measurement in three to four weeks, even though it lasts three months to make sure your pressure isn't going up. They have to explain why you have all these floaters and you'll come back in the next day. And even though you explained a lot of people come out, I got so many floaters, but we told you you had floaters. So it creates more work for the doctors and the do that's inconvenient. Um, there's certain surgeries for retinal detachment that were the gold standard for many years called a scleral buckle. That's not being used as much because it's more of a craft and with a vitrectomy, you can almost reattach the retina right on the table every time. Whereas a scleral buckle, it's more of a craft and a little bit more of an art. And uh, it does change the shape of the eye, which a vitrectomy doesn't. But we'll get into that. Those are different uh, treatments for retinal detachment. But my point is, like when I was at Kaiser and they got email and you could look at your own laboratories and you could do all these things. You can make your own appointments. People said, oh, Kaiser is really good now. What changed? Convenience. So you, if you have a know somebody who's a really good surgeon and they're up in Martinez and you live here, but this guy's the best surgeon. And you're not, I'm not talking about like going every four weeks for an injection. I'm talking about like a surgery. It's worth driving for that. I'd recommend not being convenient if you have something serious. Like my brother had esophageal cancer. We drove all the way from here to Stanford and they did connect them up pretty well. Uh, so the history of Avastin was that we were told it didn't work in the eye, right? Genetech said, we got to make a new molecule. That was Lucentis, the piece that was cut off, right? The smaller molecule. Well, right before the American Academy of Ophthalmology, I think it was like 2006 or 2005, there it is. Um, a doctor in Miami at the Baskin, Baskin Palmer Eye Institute injected a Bastin, took a whole bunch of pictures, and he goes, guess what? Stuff looks really good, really good. And that was right before the Centus came out. Gen and Tech wasn't happy. So what do you do if you're a multi-billion dollar pharmaceutical company? You pretty much get the academics and the private practices to use the Centus by giving them nurses, sponsoring their research, and so most of the, quote, influencers were using Lucentis um, from the beginning because it was FDA approved. Now, a lot of drugs that you take, well, Avastin was FDA approved, but not for the eye. So that was the, that was the rub. And of course, that's what, at the time, Genentech. Now, I think Bear bought, uh, I don't know the sequence, but somebody bought Genentech and then somebody, Novartis bought uh, them. And so that's why you see Novartis on this thing. Uh, but they get gobbled up by each other. So when he injected that and showed those pictures at the academy, everybody goes, huh? Wow. 
and especially the poorer areas that can't afford the difference in price. And I'm gonna show you that difference in price. Here's just the picture to show you that Lucentis is just a piece of Avastin. Very, very, very minor differences. The same grabbing spot, right? So it's gonna pull out VEGF. And just so you don't have to look at numbers, this is a lot of money. This is a little bit of money. <laughs> so if you have a partner that wants a nice car with air conditioning and everything like that, and it costs this much, and then they go out and tell you they bought this, that's not really good. However, in fairness to the doctors and the drug companies, there's definitely a group of patients that go, I want this. Okay, and we'll talk about the cat study. Um, so yeah, like when it yes. Did they have to repackage the uh, Avastin? Yeah, there there are issues with Avastin. Like in other words, Avastin because it was made for colon cancer. We had at Kaiser, we had Lighters Pharmacy make a whole bunch of small. Uh, aliquots of it in small syringes, sterilely under a hood, and give it to us in these packages where we had it loaded into a syringe. We just put a needle on and use that. At the VA, before they took away my Avastin recently and replaced it with a biosimilar called BioViz, um, we only use one vial per person. It's still half the price of Lucentis. But it's true that there have been epidemics of infections from bad pharmacists that are making aliquots of this. So that was another argument for, I want this, you know, and it's a good argument for that. <laughs> so the CAT study was multi, uh, you know, uh, site study, a bunch of patients and international, and they found out there is no difference between these two drugs for macular degeneration, diabetes, retinal vein occlusion. Um, and there were no difference in side effects. So they're, they're essentially similar. So as taxpayers, you may be wondering, well, wouldn't the government prevent you from using that, you know, two times to 40 times more expensive medicine in, in somebody's eye? And wouldn't it be a lot harder to get that? And surprisingly, no. Uh, so, you know, it, you can make a lot of conclusions based on that. But that was even after this study came out. And this study, of course, didn't go the way of Big Pharma because most of the world were, was using Avastin already anyways, because they knew it worked. They didn't need a big study to go. Uh, now here's the problem with all these injections. So you have wet macular degeneration and you're scared and you go through your first shot, you're relieved that the guy knew what he's doing or the woman knew what he's doing, it didn't hurt. But now you have to have more shots and you want to go on a cruise and the doctor wants to go on vacation and there's a scheduling problem and you miss an appointment and you're not in a study where they have uh, people liaisons calling you up to say you are coming in tomorrow for your appointment you know and so what happened at five years is a lot of the games that were gained for these medicines were lost so so when you're when i work with patients in the in the clinic we're always trying to figure out this, what's the most vision I can give back for you with the least amount of injections, right? Not for cost, but nobody likes doing the injections. You know, I got trigger therm from just un <laughs> pulling open, you know, syringes and needles and pulling things up and taking, you know, it's nobody really enjoys it unless you're making, you know, 400 to $600 a shot in private practice. So I was kind of, it's, I'm, I've always been a socialist medical doctor and working in Kaiser and now the VA, because when I was young, I was kind of a thief. So I, I better not, you know, get into Medicare because if I could bill for all this, I would be very biased. And even the people that don't think they're biased, you know, recommending a surgery or giving a shot that are making $600 if they do, or $30 or $50 if they don't, probably have some bias. So one of my patients right before I retired from Kaiser was a Chinese guy that had sleep apnea and he had a special kind of wet macular degener degeneration called polypoidal choridopathy, which is a very aggressive kind of wet macular degeneration. It occurs often in Asians and it oftentimes has a lot of bleeding and a special kind of 
a pattern both on angiogram and uh, both on just clinical exam. And he told me he was a PhD and that he was gonna make a drug for this. So before I left, he invited me over to a small office in Hayward at the time, about 3,000 square feet. And he did have like machines and scientists. And I go, oh, no, this is like, it's probably really going to do something here, you know? He was trying to get me to be a consultant, but I was proud of the fact that even though I had published a little bit and I had treated a lot of people that I'd never been a consultant for anyone. And I got tired of seeing all the people giving big lectures in halls that would have like a two- three slide list of all the consulting they've done. Some of these guys are super talented, super intelligent, but it was nice to stay out of that bias. So I told them that's okay, you know, it's all right. So then COVID hit and then I went back to work. So he emailed me recently and said, you got to come over to my place. And so he gave me the address and plugged it into Google. And it was in Hayward, but I don't think it was the same place. So I get there and now he's got a really big office and this is what it, this is what I thought was going to happen because I was ignorant. I thought, well, why don't they take the medicines we're given every four to six weeks and coat them like they do the steroid that lasts three months so we don't have to do this so often? But somebody's going to do that, right? Make a lot of money. Well, here's what they're going to do. And this is why they maybe haven't done that. ILE is one of the injections that we haven't talked about, one of the drugs like Lucentis and Avacin. It's an anti-VEGF drug. So Ilea just came off patent. So he was able to get the DNA for Ilea. And he's going to package that in a, uh, a adenovirus. And that's going to be injected into your eye. And that's going to go into your retina. And it's going to, your own retina is going to make Ilea or Lucentis or Avastin. And uh, that's where the future is. He's in phase 1A showed me a bunch of slides you know with rabbits and stuff and he's had 30 monkeys so there's been some animal sacrifice for all this so um but that's that's where it's going you know so so if you're if you're trying to hang on to your vision but you're getting tired of the shots this isn't right around the corner but there this there is a gene delivery for labor's amaurosis you may have heard about it was developed up in oregon health science center Labor's amaurosis is a very rare disease where the optic nerve snuffs out at about two to like 12 years old. There's different forms of, of labor. So even labor's patients that are rare patients, when they say, oh, I have labor's too, I have the same thing you have, they may not be <laughs> right either. Um, they were able to insert a gene and cure that disease. Uh, it's like a million dollars for that treatment. But the good thing is if it doesn't work, they refund your money. So, <laughs> or Medicare is money. I don't know which. So, people, yes. No, come. Take this back a little bit. You mentioned vitamins. Yes. And I'm just curious what your thinking is on vitamins like preservative for prevention or delay of macular degeneration. I've heard very different yeah. uh, opinions about that from ophthalmologists. And ophthalmologists. I'm like a contrarian in a lot of my thinking. So for a long time, I was telling, and this is why, especially with the vitamins. When I started at UCSF, we had people with dry macular degeneration. Or if you have people with dry, and so how do you get to the next patient, which is one of the ophthalmologist's main goal, okay? Uh, especially in their private practice, they have 50 patients. So how do you close an encounter with somebody and make them satisfied? Well, with dry eye, you can give them a sample of artificial tears. They feel good about that. They usually walk out going, I'll try it. You gave me something. This is for my problem. So with dry macular degeneration, we didn't have anything. We had to tell people there's nothing we can do. We didn't even know it was genetic. But at that time, they had started telling us zinc. Everyone needs zinc. So we had people taking zinc. And then they did big, small studies, showed zinc didn't do anything, did something. Then a big study showed zinc didn't do anything. So then those same people got together and form, formulated ARDS, uh, the uh, age-related um, macular gen, uh, uh, AREDS is what we call it. See, ophthalmologists can't even remember their own abbreviations. Okay. So, but I have a slide for that coming up. But I used to tell people, you can take it if you want. I don't take a lot of vitamins myself. Maybe if I'm lucky, I'll take a multivitamin once every month or every two weeks. <laughs> 
but you know a lot of people have like a you know a, just an ensemble of things that they'll take every day and i'm there's nothing wrong with that um but study after study has shown that a lot of those supplements don't do much and recent studies have shown that high doses of vitamin e which people were taking a lot in the old days have a higher risk of certain cancers so there are, if you take high doses of vitamin a you can get high intracranial pressure and there's liver problems um, especially the fat solubles high doses of vitamin d you get hypercalcemia you know, you're supposed to be trying to get more calcium but you don't want too much so the, especially the fat soluble vitamins uh, I think you have to be careful of, but as far as like, uh, the easiest thing to do is just tell people, yeah, you should take these because it's quicker. And then people feel like they're doing something. And there is a big study showing they work. I'm just telling you, like, I'm like, I wonder, you know, like nobody's taking them and going, you know, well, a small group are, they take them in and like a month later, they come back. I think my vision's better. But that's not really the goal for the study. The goal was to show that over a big period of time, you have like a 20 to 25% less chance of visual deterioration, which is significant. Um, so that's if you trust large studies. So, and we have to. So, so these are, <laughs> these are intravitreal. This is, uh, this is the injection itself, okay? There's a lot of ways to numb up somebody so they'll let you do this to them more than once. <laughs> and you might not get to do it once if you don't have numb up because they'll jump uh, if, if they're not numb enough. They'll actually, you know, it's like a reflex. They can't help it. Um, but that's what we're doing. We're injecting into the vitreous cavity. That's why they call it intravitreal injection. We're going into a special area. If you believe in God, God made the eye so we could do surgery on it. <laughs> so this is the pars plana. It's a special area that retinal specialists love. Why? We can stick needles, knives, and instruments through there, and the retina won't detach. If we stick it just right here, the retinal will tear and the retina will detach. So um, the pars plana is where that thing's going in, so that's a correct diagram. And we usually inject us a 0 .01 mils of this in there, the 0 0.1 mils, sorry. So a uh, small amount, 0 0.1 milliliter, That'll raise the pressure in the eye. So if you have glaucoma, there is a pressure spike that happens. And if you've ever had these injections, sometimes we're trying to get you a little bit more because it's not always the same amount. Your eye will darken because you've raised the pressure so high after the injection that the mean arterial pressure of the central retinal artery that comes right there is pressed. And it doesn't take but like a minute where they'll, they'll, they'll tell you, the patients will usually tell you. If not, I usually go like this. And can you count my fingers? If they can, then I'll let them go. But if they go, if, I, if they go one <laughs> or three, I'll go. Okay, is it a little dark? And some some won't see anything. They'll go, it's dark, and that's because you the pressure rises closed off the central right artery. Usually, if you just wait a minute or two, it'll come back. But if they have severe glaucoma, that's one of the risks of these injections. Yes, ma'am. Sometimes. Yeah, yeah. That's there's a lot of people who tell me they see colors. It's a little psychedelic, so a lot of stuff can happen. But that's due to the mainly the pressure change, sudden pressure change. Maybe mechanical in your case if it's white, where the, you know, you're you're kind of like pressing on the cones and rods. Yes. You talked about uh, finding a really good surgeon. How do you know? <laughs> ask nurses a lot of time like when i had to have my knees surgery uh the lady that did surgery uh, that had me instruments mary lou she you know she worked in the other uh or so i said who, who would you go to? and i would ask two or three nurses and they give you two similar two names now if you don't have access to a lot of the nurses if you have a doctor friend also, too, when people tell me they're seeing a certain doctor, I'll go in and see where did they train. But that can be that can be misleading, you know. Um, I never went to Harvard, you know. What am I going to do? Never went to Stanford. So, you know, and and if you've worked with like I remember being an intern before I started doing eye work, and you work with a Harvard medical student, and they don't write their PRNs for like uh, pain or for sleep, and you get 
waking up in the middle of the night because they didn't do that. You start to wonder about their abilities, you know. So, and when I actually, when I was uh, trying to get into residency at UCSF, I wanted to stay in California because I had gotten back after being in medical school in San Antonio. And so I got uh, inter interviews all up and down the coast. When I told my dad that I had an interview at Stanford, he goes, you got to go to Stanford. Well, at that time, Stanford wasn't even a department of ophthalmology. They were a division of surgery. Mm -hmm. They were not the strongest department. So a lot of U.S. News and World Report, there's a reason. You know, they're, they're kind of connected. So the, the L.A., the LA schools do very well down there because they're media connected. You know, UCLA is usually rated pretty highly. So but nowadays you got to take all the media a little, with a little grain of salt. So numbing it up, I haven't told you about numbing it. You first start by putting a drop on the eye that anesthetizes the superficial layers of the eye, the cornea and the conjunctiva. The conjunctiva is a loose membrane on top of the sclera. The sclera is like a basketball. It's, it's woven. Uh, collagen, it's very tough, so that if you get hit in the eye, it doesn't rupture it easy. Uh, and we're going through the sclera. So um, you can't really numb up the sclera well unless you give like a hundred of these drops and just soak it and soak it. Some people in the old days would use a Q-tip and push on the, the eye to, to numb it. That's called a pledge it. But the, the best way <laughs> is with a subconductile injection. So this is a shot before the shot. And you you know you don't pull it up in front of the patient. <laughs> you kind of hide it. You know? So before we give the shot, we give it. We it's, that's going in. We give a shot tangentially, and you have to get just underneath the conjunctiva, but you don't want to hit the sclera because the episclera has a bunch of blood vessels and nerves. And if people are on aspirin or they're on blood thinners, whenever we get a hemorrhage, we want to blame them on that but it's also touching the episclera of the sclera. Or if while you're trying to do it, I usually have them look down into to the opposite shoulder. If they're rolling like this and you're trying to numb them up, you might get a little bleeding from that. So we're always looking to blame others, but sometimes it's uh. just episclera and you'll have a red eye and we'll go over some of the things that happen, the risks of these injections. Um, but if you numb them up well, they don't feel it. So here are the complications. The big one, this is what I tell people, especially if they never had a shot before, is if, if you get, if your eye gets completely red, and I mean like impressively red, your wife or your partner or a loved one is going to say, you know what, it doesn't look, it's never been this red before. Let's go to the ER. You're going to spend six to eight hours to find out that happens. <laughs> So as convenient as we want life to be, if you wanna try and stop blindness, occasionally your eye's gonna get red. It's as simple as that. Now, if you get red every time, you're either on a blood thinner or, or the guy or myself keeps hitting the episclera or you're moving or sometimes it just happens. You have fragility. A lot of people get, this is called the subconductive hammer. So that, this is a big subconductive hammer. So this is when people usually go to the ER and they spend six to eight hours even if I've told them what I just told you to find out, first, the ER guy puts him at the back of the list because it's an eye thing. He's not having a heart attack or stroke. Then they call a general ophthalmologist who doesn't do the injections and he looks at him and goes, well, it doesn't look infected. Let me call a retinal specialist. So now you're at hour seven or eight. The retinal specialist comes in and goes, have you had any change in vision? No, actually, the vision's a little bit better or the same. Are you having any significant pain? Well, it's a little irritating because it is a little bumpy if you have a big subconjunctival hemorrhage but there's nothing to do, you just wait. And it takes, this one will take like two to four weeks. This one might be gone in a week. Sometimes when I'm giving them the next injection, it's only been four weeks, I can see a little hemorrhage where I was. And it, if you have a big nodule of blood, it's gonna liquefy because the body has its own TPA. That's where TPA came from. It's a tissue plasminogen activator. That's the stuff that breaks down clots. So if you have a big lump of blood here, over time, it's gonna liquefy and slide and move around. Like if you ever had a bruise or, or a big hemorrhage in your, your leg or something, and it slides all the way down your leg or anywhere, that's liquefied blood sliding in tissue plants. So redness by itself is nothing to worry about. What you're looking for is late pain or a big decrease in vision. 
and I'll talk to a little bit more about this. Here's another thing. You know what uh, lepers call pain? They call it the gift of pain. And the reason is lepers can't feel things in their feet, in their hands, in their face. So when they bump into things and they, they have bad proprioception too, so they'll bump the things, they'll eventually damage their fingers and their hands and their feet. So they call pain the gift of pain. It's true with the eye too. If you can't feel something, your body seems to not protect it or maintain it as well. So when we give drops to numb up the eye, after the already been dilated, vision measured, testing done, these, and you're already dry to begin with because we're all over 50, so my eyes are a little dry. If you're a woman, they're even usually drier. You're going to have, this is called superficial punctate keratitis. That's what we call it, SDK. But it's a fancy way of saying there's this little tiny breakdown of the cornea. And the cornea has, it doesn't have blood vessels normally, but it has a ton of nerves and it'll feel very uncomfortable. Occasionally, because we put a lid speculum to open up the eye, when you take the lid speculum out, it'll, it'll rub against the cornea or maybe the doctor does it. It's usually the patient goes, like the guy that I saw that has the DNA for Ilea, he switched doctors after I left because the first doctor that took care of him was good. The second doctor scratched his cornea. It's hard to say. I mean, usually you don't have a doctor going like this on the cornea, but it's possible. But more commonly, it's due to too much iodine because we put iodine on the eye to prevent infection. And we found that actually a lower dose of iodine worked well. And at first, we didn't know that. And so a lot of people we would give the injection to with the heavier concentration of iodine, they feel fine. They'd walk out, they'd go to their car, and they'd walk back to us and they'd go, there's something wrong. So we'd patch their eye and tell them, yeah, the cornea is unhappy. So when the cornea is numbed up, it stops making tears because it doesn't have the gift of pain or sensation. So that's very common, uh, especially if the eyes are already dry. So if you get a shot and then you want to go out to lunch with your friends, this is more likely to happen. Why? I tell people after you get a shot, if you want to respect the whole thing, go home and listen to music or the radio or go to sleep because then your eye will be closed. And the best treatment, the most, the treatment for the severest dry eye is sewing the eye shut. And uh, one of the general ophthalmologists that taught me at UCSF said, for people with dry eye, closing the eye and resting the eyes. Like my grandma used to, we would say, grandma, are you sleeping? No, I'm just resting my eyes. I don't know if she had dry, but that's, I remember her saying that, yes. What are we looking at? Those two green pictures. Yeah. That's fluorescein dye that is picked up when we use that for corneal abrasions. We use it to measure the pressure. So fluorescein dye, we have a cobalt blue light on our uh, slit lamps. And when we shine it, it, it lights up defects in the corneal epithelium. So you're seeing little tiny punctate defects of the corneal epithelium. And because of all the nerves in the cornea, that would be moderately uncomfortable. Now, this is what I worry about, because then I worry about that a lot too. So I tell people, go home, close your eyes, especially for the first two hours until your eye can recover from the numbing. Because once it can start feeling, it'll make tears again. But, uh, but otherwise, it just stays bone dry almost. So this is the thing we worry about. This is the collection of white blood cells in the front of the eye. And that is called a hypopion. Um, and that is bad. That's like one of, that's a, like when you're a retinal specialist, a lot of people want to make things into emergencies. That's a real emergency. Like you want to get antibiotics into that eye as soon as possible because there's no blood vessels in the vitreous. There's nothing that can help this thing recover quickly. And so the, all the bacteria that you may have gotten in there can grow unimpeded until the white blood cells get in there. And the white blood cells do get in there pretty quick because that's a big collection of white blood cells. So now what will, what else will you, because so, you, so like, it, yes. So it's not the white blood cells per se, but that's a signal that could be infected. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. That's a signal that, that is very likely infected and you need antibiotics injected in the same way that we did it. And drops do not help. So like if you're getting shots and somebody's giving you drops, antibiotic drops, they're not doing anything except creating more of this because they're just going to get in the surface of the eye and the, the concentration in the eye is going to be really low. So um, yeah, you need to have, you know, when I was in Nepal, 
I volunteered there for like three or four weeks and they had a lot of these because they, you know, the, the windows are open. There's like construction going on outside. They'll do 200 cataract surgeries by one person in one day, just switching from one to the other. They have a lot less regulations than we do. And there's consequences to that. Even though administrators in our US are going, excellent, 200 a day. How efficient, you know, we could really make some money that way. So if you have late, usually when you go home, you have mild irritation, even from the cornea, maybe a small hemorrhage or just the whole thing, the whole exam, the eyes irritated. So closing the eye for a few hours is the best thing to do. Usually when you go to sleep, the next day it feels normal. If the day after it starts feeling worse or two days after, that's a red flag, especially if it's severe. Visceral pain is kind of like, they call it visceral because like your gut tells you something is really wrong. And you usually <laughs> have new floaters, which you can get without an infection. So floaters by themselves aren't, doesn't mean you have an infection. But if you have this late onset pain, not the first day, but the second or third day, and then you have new floaters and decreased vision, just go to an emergency room and ask for a retinal specialist because you need somebody that can inject the antibiotic directly as soon as possible. And I've seen, you can lose, I've seen, unfortunately, I've seen like four or five of these and one or two of them are my own doing a lot of injections, you'll see them. Uh, don't clean, this is something we learned afterwards. Like I had a lady that had such coarse tremor, she never cleaned her eyes and she came in and she needed a shot. She had wet macular degeneration. And I was like, man, I got to clean this off. There's got to be so many bacteria on that eye. Let me get some antibiotic ointment. I cleaned it all up, gave her a shot. She got infected. And, and it, we found out after a while that any kind of cleaning the day of is not a good idea or the day after. Touching your eye or your eyelid, we all have staph epidermidis, staph aureus on your eyelashes and eyelids. It's normal to have those bacteria there. If you take antibiotics to get rid of them, you'll select for worse bacteria. So there's bacteria and fungus everywhere, Canada especially. I might be going to Canada. Okay. There's so much more to talk about. Okay, so we were. I was going to leave macular degeneration now and talk a little bit about my non-strong area glaucoma, but in general terms, anybody have any questions about macular degeneration? We can we can cycle back to all these because I've got a bigger slide set as well. If you are seeing an optometrist, how much can they diagnose to send you to the fetus? You know, some of the best eye doctors I've ever seen are optometrists. They just don't have a license to do some of the stuff we did. Some of the worst eye doctors I've seen are ophthalmologists. <laughs> maybe like, maybe psychiatry is like that. Some of the best people you've seen are psychologists and some of the worst ones are psychiatrists, right? So it really, again, it depends on like the, the quality of the optometrist. So, but... Uh, you know, like some of them have, ex like there's always a war between optometrists and ophthalmologists politically because optometrists want to do lasers and they want to get drugs and they want to do cataract surgery, but they haven't gone to medical school and ophthalmologists are saying no way, you know. So um, this is kind of like if you had an injection and you were in trouble, they should be able to tell if you're infected by seeing that, that hypopion. They should. But if you're with a weak optometrist that just does contact lenses and refractions and is very nice, but they just don't, they don't prescribe. Some of them prescribe, you know, like glaucoma medicines and antibiotics and stuff. So, um, all right. So glaucoma, yes. Okay, sure. Glaucoma, when I was at UCSF, some people said, does glaucoma really exist? You know, that's how, that's why I didn't go into glaucoma anyway. But, but um, like, is it really high pressure that causes the damage to the optic nerve? And there was a small school that thought, no, it's related to the genetics of the collagen in the optic nerve. And they're sensitive to anything. Pressure, or low, low tension glaucoma that we talked about earlier kind of fueled that argument. So glaucoma is basically high pressure in the eye pushing against all those retinal cells that are going to form the optic nerve. And it's very gradual. I don't know if any of you guys knew who Kirby Puckett was. He was an all-star center fielder, I think, for the Minnesota Twins. And he ended up needing glaucoma surgery. He was playing while he was developing moderate to severe glaucoma. So glaucoma 
this is a little bit simplified, but it'll take away your peripheral vision. So you can still see well centrally, still see well centrally, still see well centrally, and pretty soon you don't. Um, a little bit like what retinitis pigmentosa does, but it's variable. So he found it. I mean, he was hit batting 90 mile an hour fastballs, you know? So it usually affects the peripheral retina first and the central retina, which has much more redundancy and much more richness and strength for whatever reason is, is, is it affected later. Um, again, you make fluid from your celerity body, which is right behind the iris. It travels through the iris between the lens and the iris, and it goes through the, oh, sorry, this is a ciliary pod, and it goes through here, and it goes around the iris, and it goes into the angle of the eye. So that's an open angle glaucoma. Uh, that, that mesh work is like the drain of your eye. So the genetic form of open angle glaucoma is some problem with the mesh work getting clogged over time. We don't know exactly what. Uh, one of the guys that worked at the UCSF was growing trabecular meshwork cells in, in vitro and trying to figure out what was going on, but no one really knows. Um, so, yeah, a block, this is for open angle, a block meshwork. You can treat that with laser. Some people have had SLT or laser trabeculoplasty where they laser the drainage site. We have all different kinds of lasers. So if you tell somebody again, I had laser, well, it could be a YAG laser, it could be an SLT's laser, it could be a diode laser, it could be for your capsule, it could be for your everything. You know, there's just so many different uh, different kinds of lasers. So how do you diagnose glaucoma? You usually, we look at the optic nerve, there are characteristics of the optic nerve that especially in the old days we relied upon. And then we did visual field tests. The modern visual field testing is done like this, although we had a drug guy come, a Humphrey guy come to the VA recently where you have a virtual uh, thing that you put over your, um, you know, your eyes. So you wouldn't need to, you could probably sit in the waiting area and do the test. So that's, mm -hmm. that's under development, but you have to be uh, kind of awake to do this and it's tedious. Mm -hmm. So it, it registers false positives, false negatives, mm -hmm. fixation losses, and there's always some of those. That's another reason I didn't go into glaucoma. Okay, that's the physiologic cut, okay? So you should be able to tell which eye that is by the fact that it's on, it's on this side. So the nasal side of the retina, although this isn't retina, that's where the optic nerve is, see, is in the temporal field, right? So if that's on the temporal side, this is a left eye. Um, and that's normal. So this is like a pretty good result from the Humphrey visual field test. If you had that and they were about glaucoma, they say, okay, come back in a year. We're not too worried about you. And what we're looking for is not just normal, but if you have a few areas of abnormality, which some people always do, we're looking for progression. And progression occurs slowly. This is like an arcuate defect coming off the optic nerve. And that's, you know, moderate glaucoma right there. Now here you can see there's, there's fixation losses, there are false positives and false negatives. So there's all these computer programs to try and sift all this stuff out that gets better and better. Probably AI will take over this area. So this is the old days, this is what we did. We looked at the optic nerve and if you had a larger cut, we were suspicious. And there's a lot more subtlety than that. And glauc I, if you talk to a modern glaucoma specialist, they'll tell you all kinds of things, not just a large cut, but all little kinds of characteristics that you can see that are consistent with glaucoma would be a large cup. Because the problem is certain races have larger cups. African-Americans have larger cups and, that are normal without glaucoma. Okay, so, so this is the entire, so we're looking at cup to disc. So this is the disc and this is the cup. So if you have a 0.1 cup, that's a very small cup to disc, you probably don't have glaucoma because that means that the cup is very small. Let's say it was this small and this, so that's like one to 10. If you have a very large cup, that makes us worry. Like this, you could say this is like maybe a point. Is it just the machine determination? I mean, what was it? No, it's, it's not reliable because it's us looking and, and, you know, through 
people moving their eye around, we say, okay, that looks like plip. That's the exact nerve that affects where you're looking at where the optic nerve is. Optic nerves going back that way yeah, to right. the brain. But that's right at the site. Yeah. This is the optic nerve, yeah. Yeah. So that so when you when you're evaluating glaucoma, you're looking. Sure. 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 Yeah. Yes. Any questions? How do we keep our eyes healthy? What uh, if we don't have a genetic problem? What's the best way not to have these problems? You know, like I, I have a slide later that says health is vascular health. Remember, we talked about transport and removal of waste and, and delivery of nutrients. Like a heart attack is lack of delivery of oxygen and blood to the heart, right? A stroke is the same thing. A vein occlusion is the same thing. Now, some of the diseases we talked about are leakage diseases, but... Um, Vascular health is good general health, and it, that doesn't apply to necessarily orthopedics or other things like that. But, you know, really good vascular health, it's the same boring stuff, like good blood pressure, good diet. You can throw in the vitamins if you want to. Um, and, that yeah. Is that, is that the blind spot size or something? The cup is just a variable size of... The op of where just the shape of the optic nerves and people saw that people with high pressures had cups that not only were large but got larger as they lost visual feed. But I'm going to show you later when we come back uh, next week that there's ways to digitally measure this so that you don't have doctors who are going, okay, that looks like a 0.6 to me. And then you go look at their old note, it was 0.5 last time, or it was 0.7 last time, which would kind of be impossible. You know, you go from a larger cup to a small, smaller cup. So um, a lot of this is going to be locked in by the imaging studies now that allows to compare previous to current and are much more reliable in some cases than human observation, unfortunately. <laughs> All right, you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.